Lisp programs itself, Paul Graham. Lisp is a programmable programming language. John Fodoraro. If you give someone Fortran, they have Fortran. If you give someone Lisp, they have any language they want. Guy Steele. I heard these words for years without truly understanding what they meant until I dove into the history of Lisp, a story that begins with a young genius raised during the Great Depression, expelled from university. That intersects with the birth of artificial intelligence and is marked by a book that, despite looking like a spellbook, has illuminated generations of programmers. Today, you're going to discover what makes Lisp unique, but more importantly, you're going to discover a new way of thinking about software. A way that can forever change how you write code. Lisp was created by John McCarthy. And if the story of this language is fascinating, that of its creator might be even more so. Because John didn't have an easy childhood. He was born in Boston in 1927 to an Irish immigrant father and a Lithuanian immigrant mother. He spent his childhood under the shadow of the Great Depression, watching his parents struggle to support the family. Throughout those harsh 1930s, young John had to endure move after move. His parents traveled across the country looking for work. They eventually settled in California, where his father found a job as an organizer for one of the most important labor unions in America, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, an organization known for its defense of social unionism and progressive political causes. But don't think John's father saw this merely as a job. No, he was deeply committed to the cause. John's parents were staunch communists. From an early age, they taught him Russian and raised him on Soviet books. So, how did this young man, raised in a working class, ideologically driven household, go on to create one of the most revered programming languages in the world? It was precisely thanks to one of those Soviet books he read as a child that John began to take an interest in science. By the time he was in high school, while his classmates were out smoking, trying to get alcohol, or hitting on girls, John was reading and studying college-level math books from cover to cover. John was a true genius. When he graduated from high school, he enrolled at the prestigious Caltech, where he was allowed to skip the first two years of his mathematics degree, because he had already mastered the material on his own as a teenager. His time at university seemed to be going smoothly. Who would imagine that someone like him could get expelled? But yes, John was kicked out of Caltech for failing to meet a requirement, something he simply couldn't bring himself to do. In fact, it's something many programmers also struggle to do. I'm talking of course about physical education. Caltech expelled John for not attending PE classes. Our genius was two years ahead in math, but eight years behind in physical fitness. After being expelled, John had only one path forward, the military. Yes, it sounds unbelievable, but John had to enlist and serve in the army in order to be readmitted to Caltech. After breaking a sweat, literally, John completed his mathematics degree and went on to earn his PhD at Princeton. Four years later, in 1955, John McCarthy was working as a professor at Dartmouth in New Hampshire. It was there that he coined two of the most repeated words in today's tech world. Yes, 70 years ago, McCarthy came up with the term artificial intelligence. Back in the 1950s, there was a wide range of terms used to refer to thinking machines. Cybernetics, automata theory, complex information processing. In 1955, McCarthy decided to organize a conference to clarify and develop the ideas within this emerging field of thinking machines. He didn't know what to call the conference, how to unify all these concepts. After much deliberation, he settled on the neutral term, artificial intelligence. John wasn't organizing the event alone. He was joined by three other giants, Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, Marvin Minsky, co-founder of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, and Nathaniel Rochester, architect of the IBM 701 computer. Together, they submitted a proposal to the Rockefeller Foundation to fund a summer seminar at Dartmouth, the first event in history dedicated to artificial intelligence. The Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence brought together 11 leading experts in computation and mathematics to develop machines that could use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve problems that had previously required human intelligence, and even improve themselves. In short, thinking machines, what we now call AI. This conference is considered the constitutional convention of artificial intelligence. It marks the origin, not just of the term, but of the entire field of study. But what does LISP have to do with all this? 
There was an idea that had been lingering in John McCarthy's mind for a while. He wanted to build a language on the IBM 704 to program artificial intelligence. He was convinced that IBM was the right platform to drive the future of AI forward. But something was missing. He wasn't sure how to structure the language to make it efficient for solving problems that required reasoning. Eventually, inspiration struck at the Dartmouth conference, thanks to the work of two other attendees, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. Newell and Simon were the creators of the Information Processing Language, or IPL for short. It wasn't a typical programming language, like Python, Java, or C. These researchers were trying to create a system that could generate proofs in propositional logic. Yes, propositional logic. The kind of logical statements like P implies P or Q, proven through truth tables. Newell and Simon were aiming to build a system capable of formal reasoning a primitive precursor to artificial intelligence that processed symbolic expressions using lists. That's exactly what McCarthy ended up building, a Lisp processor. In fact, Lisp stands for Lisp Processing. Don't worry if that doesn't make total sense yet, we'll come back to it. But here's the twist. McCarthy didn't actually like IPL at first. He preferred the approach used by Fortran, a newly created language that used algebraic expressions similar to conventional math instead of lists. Still, McCarthy believed that Lisp could be a useful way to model problems in artificial intelligence. And so, driven by his research in AI, McCarthy set out to create a kind of Lisp processing language that would also retain an algebraic nature, something like a hybrid between IPL and Fortran. I should note that, through his experience programming in Fortran in the years that followed, McCarthy gradually became disillusioned with it. He found it limiting when working on AI. For instance, Fortran didn't have a map list function to apply a given operation to an entire list. That might seem basic now, but it was crucial for McCarthy's work, and the dominant scientific language of the time simply didn't offer it. So McCarthy did what geniuses often do. When something doesn't exist, they invent it from scratch. At the time McCarthy was developing Lisp, he was working at MIT. After refining the idea of the language, one of his students, Steve Russell, began implementing it on an IBM 704 using punch cards. Russell would later become famous for creating Space War, the first mass-produced video game, but that's another story. In 1958, Russell was still just a student when he told McCarthy he was going to implement eval, the core function of Lisp, on the IBM 704, John practically laughed in his face. Ho ho, he said, you're confusing theory with practice. This eval function is meant to be read, not executed. And yet Russell went ahead and did it. He managed to compile the eval function on a real computer. A bold student had just built the first Lisp interpreter. This new language wasn't just a theoretical tool, as its creator had believed, but a fully functional and practical programming language. That dual nature of being both mathematically elegant and operationally powerful is one of the things that makes Lisp so unique. Another defining feature of Lisp is its heavy use of parentheses, but that's actually a result of coincidence. Lisp programs consist of lists called S expressions, short for symbolic expressions. The first element in the list is the operator, and the remaining elements are its arguments, which may themselves be lists or atomic symbols. Atoms can be thought of as the primitive building blocks used to form lists. McCarthy's original idea was for S expressions to serve as Lisp's internal structure, while programmers would write code using M expressions. M expressions resembled the way we normally write functions, more familiar and intuitive for most people. Under the hood, Lisp would use S expressions, but to the user, it would present a friendlier, more readable syntax. To distinguish them, S expressions used round parentheses and M expressions used square brackets. But according to Stoyan's article, Lisp History, the IBM machine McCarthy was using at MIT didn't have square brackets on the keyboard. So he and his team dropped the idea of M expressions and stuck with S expressions. That purely practical decision ended up shaping the entire look and feel of Lisp and contributing to its reputation. No one writes math on paper in this way. This style of writing operations is called Polish notation, named after Polish mathematician Jan Lukasiewicz, who first used it. In 1960, McCarthy finally published the now famous paper that introduced Lisp to the world. In that original publication, McCarthy already sensed that what he had created was more than a programming language. He realized that Lisp was an elegant mathematical system, something deeper and more universal. He would later write, Lisp is a way to describe computable functions that is cleaner than Turing machines. McCarthy had, in many respects, gone beyond Alan Turing's formalism. 
he had created a more elegant, more straightforward model of algorithms and one that could actually be implemented in a real-world programming language. Paul Graham would later say in his paper on Lisp's origins that what McCarthy did for programming is similar to what Euclid did for geometry. McCarthy axiomatized computation, and he did it in a beautiful way. All of this carries great theoretical significance. But what is it that gives Lisp its aura? What has led so many programmers to call it the language of God? And more importantly, if Lisp is so elegant and powerful, why isn't it the only programming language in use today? Two decades after its creation, Lisp had become the native language of artificial intelligence. Just as McCarthy had hoped, its symbolic expressions were very useful at a time when most AI was symbolic. In addition, its regular syntax made it easy to extend the language to new machines. That allowed Lisp to grow rapidly. However, by the mid-1970s, AI researchers were running into computational limitations. AI programs written in Lisp had become so large that the 18-bit machines of the time couldn't handle them. So Peter Deutsch at MIT had a big idea to design computers specifically for running Lisp. Today, more and more manufacturers are adding NPUs, neural processing units, to their devices. The idea is that our devices should have dedicated circuits designed to run deep learning algorithms because GPUs, the graphics processors that had been used until now, are starting to fall short. The new trend in AI is to buy devices with NPU. Something similar happened in the 1970s with Lisp machines. They felt like they had come from the future, high performance computers for the time, with circuits specifically designed to run Lisp. They also included powerful graphics and animation software, which was necessary for AI applications. What happened when you combined Lisp, computational power, and graphical interfaces? Magic, at least by the standards of the time. For example, here's a graphical pathfinding algorithm. It might seem trivial today, you could recreate it in an hour. But in the 1980s, it looked like something from another world. It didn't feel like Lisp was running on the machine. It felt like the machine was thinking in Lisp. These Lisp applications and their close connection to artificial intelligence played a big role in the language's mystique. Owning a dedicated Lisp machine in the 1980s meant having a cutting-edge, incredibly expensive device capable of doing things that had seemed impossible just a few years earlier. And there's another factor that cemented Lisp as the divine language. A book. Not just any book. The book. The book that changed everything. In 1985, MIT professors Harold Abelson, Gerald Sussman, and Julie Sussman published the book, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. For short, let's just call it the book. It introduced readers to programming using the scheme language, a dialect of Lisp. For two decades, this was the official textbook for MIT's introductory programming course. The book used this Lisp-like language to illustrate deep concepts in the art of computer programming. Yes, it's true, the authors could have chosen any language for this purpose, but they chose Lisp, and they wrote a brilliant book that helped make the language more popular. A brilliant book, yes, but also a mysterious one. Just look at the cover. On it, you see a wizard or alchemist approaching a table to perform some kind of incantation. In one hand, he holds an ancient compass-like instrument. In the other, a sphere with the words Ival and Apply, two of Lisp's most important functions. Opposite him, a woman gestures toward the table. In the background, the Greek letter Lambda floats, glowing with a mystical aura. What's happening here? And more importantly, why does the table have an animal's foot? It seems like the wizard has unlocked the secrets of the universe using eval and apply. A strange cover, to say the least, for a programming book. The book's oddities don't stop at the cover. In the preface, we're told that the book is about three phenomena. The human mind, computer programs, and the computer itself. The authors even say that programming should not be considered a branch of engineering, but rather of procedural epistemology. Programs are simply a new way of structuring thought, one that by chance can be executed by silicon machines. Yes, I know, it sounds like I'm describing a philosophy book, but I promise, it's a programming book. If you don't believe me, the book is freely available on its website. Go take a look, you'll find the link in the description. Enough mysticism. 
We've seen that Lisp has a reputation as the language of God because of its origin, its unusual syntax, the futuristic applications it had in the 1970s, and that strange philosophy book on programming. Oh, and because of the testimonials from those who say Lisp opens your eyes and makes you a better programmer. But now it's time to understand what Lisp actually is. No, I'm not going to teach you how to program in Lisp. I'm just going to explain in under two minutes and in very simple terms what makes it so special. What McCarthy discovered in his original paper. And to do that, I'll rely on Paul Graham's excellent exposition in The Roots of Lisp. In 1960, John McCarthy published a seminal paper in which he did for programming what Euclid did for geometry. That's how Paul Graham's paper begins. And it's something we should be clear about. What I'm about to explain is a way to axiomatize computation. It's a formalism, an alternative to the Turing machine. The central element of this formalism is the expression. An expression is either an atom, which is simply a sequence of letters, like foo, bar, or just a, or a list containing zero or more expressions. A list is written with parentheses, and its elements are separated by spaces. For example, the empty list is a valid expression, as are foo bar or A, B, C. Remember, Lisp stands for Lisp Processing, so it should come as no surprise that lists are at the core of the language. Valid Lisp expressions return values, that is, they can be evaluated. To evaluate a list, the first element is interpreted as an operator and the rest as its arguments. Think back to Polish notation. For example, if plus denotes the addition operator, then the expression plus 3, 2 returns 5, and plus 3, plus 1, 2 returns 6. Actually, addition is a poor example for our purposes here. We're trying to axiomatize computation. In Lisp, operations like addition are built as high-level functions based on more fundamental operators. So what are these fundamental operators that allow us to write any algorithm? McCarthy discovered that there are just seven. The seven commandments of code. He called them, quote, atom, eq, car, cdr, cons, and cond. These are the seven axioms with which all computation can be built. For example, quote x returns the value x, or eqxy returns the atom t, meaning true, if x and y are the same atom, otherwise it returns the empty list, meaning false. With these axioms, and a way to define functions, you can perform any computation, and you can also do something remarkable. Because it turns out that using this formalism, you can write a function, the famous evil function that McCarthy's student implemented, that acts as an interpreter for the language. In other words, Lisp can be used to write a function that takes a Lisp expression as input and returns its value as output. Informally, people say that Lisp can write itself. It's quite incredible. This shows us what Lisp really is, says Graham. It's not so much something McCarthy designed as something he discovered. It's not intrinsically a language for AI or for rapid prototyping or for any other purpose at that level. It's what you get when you try to axiomatize computation. Over time, the average programming language is getting closer to Lisp. So by understanding eval, you're understanding what is likely to become the dominant model of computation in the years to come. In other words, according to Graham, Lisp is not just a theoretical temple for expanding our minds. It's a practical tool for everyday use. So practical, in fact, that modern programming languages are becoming more and more like it. And he's not the only one who thinks so. Graham... Eric Raymond and other well-known programmers helped Lisp experience a revival starting in the early 2000s. Today, the most popular Lisp dialects are Common Lisp, Scheme, Emacs Lisp, Clojure, and Racket. I'm sure many of you are familiar with object-oriented programming, but did you know that there's such a thing as language-oriented programming? These are programming languages designed to create other programming languages. Knowing this kind of language is like having a toolbox to build new tools. These custom tools, designed for very specific tasks, are known as domain-specific languages or DSLs. Today, Racket is probably the most popular language for building other languages. The power of Lisp is hard to overstate. It works as a mathematical formalism for programming artificial intelligence and for building other programming languages. Because Lisp is not just a language, it's an idea that can describe itself. Maybe it's not the language of God, but if God were to program, he'd probably use eval, 